Hey, this is Derek, and listen to Skepticality for Tuesday, January 31st, 2012. <laughs> Skepticality, little skepticality. Science! Soupy, Derek, uh, Chris Solnadal here from Melbourne, Australia, just sitting in the car, just finished listening to your Neil deGrasse Tyson interview. Um, wanted to say uh, what a fabulous interview it was, and uh, it was, uh, I hadn't fully appreciated what a giant uh, this uh, Neil Tyson guy actually is. We don't get him out here, I don't think. Anyway, um, I was particularly impressed with uh, the sort of clarity of responses uh, to your questions, and in particular his um, his three-tiered answer to your question about you know what would he do to get people to look up. Uh, clearly, the guy's uh, quite amazing communicator. So thanks uh, for your work and thanks for uh, interviewing him. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to many more shows. Been listening for a long time now. Keep up the excellent work. Really appreciate it. Bye now. Welcome back to another episode of Skepticality, the show that brings you news and interviews with scientists, skeptics, and critical thinkers from all around the world for the promotion of science. So, yep, back to just little me once again. And I hope you all enjoyed getting to hear from Swoopy last episode, but she liked being back. So, don't worry, she'll be stopping in from time to time. Just this episode, we both got really busy, so. She couldn't make it. Also, that little message you heard just before me, that was one of the voicemail messages we get. If you want to be featured, send us a voicemail at about anything from our episodes or just about things that are happening in your neck of the woods that happen to be science-based or skeptical. Just send us a voicemail toll-free at 1-866-800-2121. That's 1-866-800-2121. So we had a winner for the t-shirt giveaway last episode. The winner was able to get his entry in within 40 minutes, which probably means he stopped the episode to send the email and then listen to the rest of it, we hope. <laughs> Keep that in mind, because this time we have another giveaway, and it's a signed copy of the fantastic graphic novel, Dr. DeBunko. It's by Chris Wisnia. You can hear our interview with Chris back on episode 35 of our show. A link to that episode will be in the show notes. To win a signed copy of Dr. DeBunko, all you need to do is to be one of the first to send in an email to hosts at skepticality.com and tell us what the name of Chris Wisnia's graphic novel company is and what it means. The first three people who send in the correct answer will get a signed copy of the book. So this week we have an interview with Daniel Bolini. Daniel is an Italian writer, martial artist, and university professor. His newest book, 50 Things You're Not Supposed to Know, Religion, is part of the series of books being put out by the Disinformation Company, who happen to be the same folks behind the popular disinformation website at disinfo.com. Disinfo.com is a website which is all about news and information that you didn't know you needed to know. <laughs> So, Daniel, have you here? You uh, have a new book that came out. Yep. Now, before we get into your book, uh, you are a university professor, a writer, and a martial <laughs> artist. Yeah, and, the usual mix, right? Yeah, well, the last one I found fun. You are involved with MMA? Yeah. I've done, well, I mean... Recently, not so much, but uh, I've done a couple of pro fights. I've done a bunch of uh, smokers, which are kind of the unsanctioned amateur fights. So, um, yeah. You also wrote a book about the philosophy of martial arts. Yeah. How did your interest in martial arts came before or after your being a professor and writer? Which one came first? No, it's kind of funny. I mean, I started martial arts when I was a teenager, and I was... Um, 
it's sort of the opposite of what everybody does in the sense that typically people get into it out of you know machismo testosterone and then they mellow out and they see sort of the deeper aspects of it mm-hmm. i started out having this old very romanticized uh, philosophical image of martial arts it's all about zen this zen that the beauty of movement the deeper philosophy and as time went by i started feeling like you know what that's philosophy is great and all, but let's shut up and wrestle now. Let's you know, <laughs> let's just fight and be done with it. So it's it's kind of the opposite of what it's supposed to happen, but it was fun, you know. So I started out with a lot of uh, Chinese martial arts first, and then uh, eventually I switched more to combat sports, doing more um, jujitsu, boxing, wrestling, that kind of thing. Which obviously then is for MMA. Now, were you doing that? MMA stuff before it became a big deal on TV? Um, let me think. Uh, kind of, yeah. I mean, I've, I've been watching it pretty much from the get-go. I think I started watching UFC 2 or 3 or something. And then I, I was still doing martial arts, but I kind of the switch to training in a more MMA type of style. Probably 2002, something like that, mm. somewhere on there. So all this happened before you became a professor, philosopher, writer? Let's see. I started teaching in 2001. So roughly around, well, the MMA part roughly around the same time. The martial arts, no, I've been doing before. But um, uh, MMA, yeah, was somewhere around the same general area. And um, writing, writing was, I mean, it's kind of funny because my dad uh, has written a million books and my mom wrote books and she's a journalist. So writing was kind of something I grew up with just because um, it's kind of what everybody did around the house. So I started writing fairly young. I published a book in Italy when I was 22 and then uh, kind of went on from there. My English still sucks, so I couldn't quite pull it off in the U.S. It took me a while to be able to uh, adapt. And then, um, and then, you know, my speaking voice has a thick, crazy accent, but my <laughs> written one doesn't. So eventually now I can uh, write in English all right, just as much as I can do in Italian. Oh, yeah. I mean, you still have that thick accent. You've been here in America for, what, 19, 20 years? Yep, 20 years. Unless you're on TV or radio most mm-hmm. of the time. Most people don't have a reason to get rid of an accent anyway. And plus, women like it, so <laughs> screw it. I'm now getting rid of it. Well, you see, I was wondering if that was the reason. That's the only reason why I do anything ever. <laughs> well, you're Italian. <laughs> exactly. So we can get in your book, and your book is religion. Uh-huh. The things that, well, describe your book. Um, it's basically this information, the, the publishing company, they have a series that was called uh, 50 Things You're Not Supposed to Know. They did a few books uh, um, with that type, but it's basically part of a series, you know. Then they decided, initially it was sort of a general 50 Things, then they started tailoring it to different specific arguments. And they asked me to do one on religion that they wanted to do. And so I, it was, it was fun because I had to, I could come up with just any 50 things, people, events, uh, anything that was strange, bizarre, preferably offensive, you know, <laughs> anything that was in some way or another, either not maybe part of something that's well known, but maybe the details of something were not so well known or just some stories that are way out there that people don't or may not be familiar when they think of uh, organized religion. Well, yeah, a lot of that is very true. When I was reading the book, I noticed that you really highlighted on the things that people revere, but yet mm-hmm. they don't really, they've never really read the Bible to actually follow through with the rest of it. To oh, of understand. course. It's yep. like it's like the fun part, like when Moses comes down on the mountain, off the mountain, mm-hmm. things are yep. happy, but then what happens after that? Yeah, I know if somebody was to ask, uh, you know, if you were to ask somebody a question and say, who's the guy in history who uh, masterminded the murder of some 3,000 people because of his own, you know, 3,000 civilians, by the way, because of his own uh, uh, religious ideology, you know, Osama bin Laden would have come to mind. But nope, right there, well, I mean, of course, yeah, you have bin Laden, but also right smack out of the Bible, Moses is behind the exact same story, where he comes down from the mountain, finds that some Jewish people are not so sold on his version of monotheism, gets royally pissed over the fact that these guys are worshipping different gods, 
and as his loyalists grab their swords and hack them to pieces. Such a nice little guy. Yep, <laughs> lovely. And right after he just came off the top of a mountain where he told everybody you shouldn't kill people. Yeah, but then of course, if you're not honoring the god that tells you that you shouldn't be killing people, then of course you should kill these people. <laughs> yeah, and you also, in this book, mention a, a, a fun blueprint on how to start your own cult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had fun with that one. It's, uh, I forget, I think the title that chapter title is uh, how to get money and sex from your followers by starting your own cult and uh, I was having a little fun because obviously most cults tend to follow the same patterns and uh, from the outlandish claim to the weird names for the founders to the you know all the step by step that you need to do so yeah if you are into this is create your own cult 101 how to do it <laughs> yeah I thought that was very funny because it's something that most of the time doesn't get published <laughs> in a way. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and one of the most, I guess I could say, offensive to many people mm -hmm. would be some of the truth be behind the weird cohort between Christians and Israel. Right. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, most uh, Christian fundamentalists have hated Jews forever. And so there have been, you know, persecution of Jewish people in every Christian country since the beginning. And yet now you find the people who are the biggest friends of Israel tend to be Christian fundamentalists. And it's like, why, you know, did these guys change their mind all of a sudden? And it's not really about changing their mind. There's like this weird uh, interpretation of the book of Revelations in the Bible that... Um, that basically suggests that Jesus will come back only when A, you need to have a state of Israel, B, the state of Israel need to rebuild the temple, C, Israel enemies need to attack um, and try to destroy the state of Israel, and at that point, Jesus will come back. So the whole idea of the support for the state of Israel is we need them there so that they can get attacked so that Jesus will come back. So before the 40s when we didn't have Israel in, the, in where it mm -hmm. is now. When was Israel there to begin with? Right. I mean, that's why they wanted them. They wanted Jewish people back that they wanted eventually to, for them to get back to Israel, to start a state, to do the whole thing. Otherwise, the prophecy couldn't come through, or at least the way they interpreted the prophecy, because the book of Revelation is a mess. I mean, it's extremely hard to interpret in any which way. But the way it, around the turn of the century, late 1800s, early 1900s, it got to be interpreted was that you needed the state of Israel occupied by Jews and they, them rebuilding the temple and then being attacked. Funny part is, I think a lot of people don't see it that way anymore. Right. But as you put, put in the book, that's kind of how they started. Now, do you think that most fundamental Christians now even think about it that way? No, I mean, I don't think the word think and Christian fundamentalists go together very often, but um, they, um, no, probably not. Um, well, it depends who you ask. I'm sure some people still have strong anti-Jewish feelings, and so their support for Israel is based on this idea that we need them and all of that stuff. But I'm sure also things change, so I'm sure some of them mellowed out, and they are not quite as uh, anti-Jewish as they were in the past. And now they just sympathize with them because of the terrorism issue. Right, which is kind of funny too because I mean Christianity and um, Judaism, they actually all Western religions, they are all spin off of the same thing essentially. You know, they all start from this Adramic tradition and it's just the way they interpret it, the way, you know, everybody, of, every one of them tell that they heard God's voice and that God's word is contained in their books but then each one gets a different message, and so that's why they argue with each other. Yeah, and you mentioned that that wasn't until recently when we had traditions in Western religion that are things like our traditions and values, they all spurred from a different thing altogether that wasn't Christianity. Yeah, I mean, of course, all the religions... Nothing is born out of nothing. So Christianity, even Judaism, Judaism was born in an environment where there were a bunch of different religions being practiced. So in turn, they influenced them as well. 
Zoroastrianism played a huge role, uh, you know, a bunch of things, a bunch of different traditions. The, the whole cult of Mitra, which was originally a Persian god, has enormous similarities with the whole Jesus story. There are, you know, inevitably, if you grow up in a certain area and certain religious traditions are practiced there, they will influence the birth of whatever new religion comes up in the area. You have a whole chapter of the book just about that, all the different religions that have the same stories that are in the Bible that came long before the Bible. There's definitely, I mean, and that is the short, tiny little chapter. They can have, uh, you know, these, you can write books on this stuff because there's so much material on this. And you also get into respected things like Zen. Mm -hmm. And I think it's funny I read that part of the book. It's like, you know, I remember reading that at some point. I forgot it too, that where Zen came from. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, Zen is basically the meet. Originally, it starts out as the meeting between Buddhism being imported from India into China, Taoism already been there, and the two of them uh, mixing together. So Buddhism is kind of a, I mean, Zen is sort of a Taoist version of Buddhism or a Buddhist version of Taoism, however you want to call it. But basically, that's the mix right there. And then the quote-unquote peaceful part about Zen it's kind of funny when you think about why it came to be. Yeah, I mean, the Buddhism is by definition, you know, one of the big principles of Buddhism is about non-injury, so how you are not supposed to be hurting, not even just other human beings, but even animals and so on. So it's funny that it starts as this very peace-loving religion, and in many places it may still be, but then it becomes very popular with the samurai class, and the samurai are professional killers, you know, they make a living by killing people. So it's sort of bizarre how you can edit certain aspects of religions that may be not quite fitting with your day-to-day -day life, but because you're attracted by others. So in, the, in this case, the samurai were attracted by the Zen quality of being in the moment, having no attachment, uh, which ultimately leads to being unafraid of that and not being... Um, if you can live without attachment, you can go into battle and not worry about whether you're going to come out alive or not because you're just focusing on the moment. And that gives you a huge advantage on the battlefield because you don't freeze up with fear. That was one of the big uh, appeals of Zen for the samurai. The fact that then they had all this peace-loving stuff is like, yeah, yeah, there's that there, there too, but we'll sweep that to the side because it's, you know, we got people to kill. So, it Sounds like nothing has changed. No, I mean, people, one of the beautiful things about religion, and not just religion, but everything else, is that people, really people make up their own religions as they go, more than they follow. When people say they follow a religion, nobody follows jack shit. People <laughs> um, edit messages to suit their own lives. And I have nothing against it. I think it's great. I think everybody should do that. Just don't lie about it. You know, just don't tell me that... Uh, you are following something when obviously inevitably everybody does a cut and paste and focus on some aspects and ignore others. I, I remind people that all the time about that. It's like, you know, if you want to use the Bible as a reference and say that gay people shouldn't exist or anything like <laughs> that, well, then if I have to believe you and you believe that, then I have to believe that you believe everything else that's in the book, which means if you read it, you have to be a little on the odd side. Oh, totally. Like, no, I mean, the Bible's pretty strict about you shouldn't have or have tattoos. Having right. Jesus on a cross in a building yep. is yep. idol yep. worship, and that's especially forbidden. All these things are actually more often cited in the Bible than the one passage about being gay, and that's like, and that's not even like clear if that's what they're saying or not. No, and that's one of the things about the beauty of the for Christians about the Old Testament is that anytime the Old Testament say what you want to say, then great. It's the word of God, it's the truth, we want it. Anytime the Old Testament says something that seems a little tasteless today, then you can just say, well, that's the Old Testament, we don't really follow that anymore, we go by the New Testament. Which is awesome because you really can... You can use it if you want to, and you can ignore it if you don't, and it gives you the perfect excuse. I wish that, you know, my computer programming language was like that. I could do so much better. Yes, yeah, seriously. You get the idea that your goal here is to 
try to make people think about religion, make it yep. enjoyable. Mm -hmm. It's something you should discuss with others, even if you ex expect there to be a difference of opinion, which I think that happens all of the time. So this book's really about getting people to talk about religion? Yeah, absolutely. And I guess it's, um, to me, getting into religious discussion doesn't have to be a fight because ultimately there really is nobody that just by the label they carry, whatever religion they belong to, I'm going to, you know, I need to hate you because you belong to such and such religion because ultimately everybody has different interpretations of the very same religion. There are basically 30,000 different denominations of Christianity and each one interprets things differently from you know a very liberal end to a very conservative end, everything in between. And so it's um, really the fact that somebody belonged to a certain tradition doesn't tell you much about them. You know, the only thing is uh, I'm interested in how people apply these ideas. So as long as people keep an open mind and have a sense of humor about things, I have nothing against anybody from any background. So it's cool to have uh, discussions. I have a problem when their interpretation become this intolerant, bloodthirsty one, then yes, I have a problem. But um, just because they, there's a label attached to them, that's, that doesn't tell me anything. It's more about, well, if you want to talk about it, at least understand the facts of what happened in the past. Yeah, that would be a good start. And that's a hard thing to get people to realize. Yeah, definitely. Tell people a little bit about, because you you're also involved with a really interesting website that I think most of my listeners would actually really enjoy, the Disinformation website? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are, the, they are the publisher of the book, so they have a lot of material on their website, and uh, some of them are taken from the books, some of them instead are random articles that they either put together or the information that they get from other sources. But, um, yeah, they are the publisher of the books, and they are, they are great. I like them. <laughs> and tell people where they can find you on the blog and things like that. If you go um, on the disinformation website, and if you, uh, you, know, you Google them, there's uh, lots of different stuff are going to show up. But basically, uh, if you go on their stuff, you can search anything you want in their site, find some. They put some expert um they, they cut out a few things from my book and put them in there. So there are a few articles taken straight from the book. There are There's a ton of different interesting material that they put up there. So it's worth checking out. And they can, you can find out all about how, where to get your book. I know it's on Amazon. Yeah. And you Amazon can actually, uh, is there anywhere people can see you or doing book sightings or anything like that? Um, <clears throat> recently, let's see what has been going on lately. The... Um, I've done a few podcasts. There were a few that were fun. I did um, I did one with Joe Rogan, um, the guy who um, he's the commentator for UFC, and he also is um, was the host of Fear Factor. And he's a fun guy. He's a really fun guy. We had a good chat. I was on a podcast with Adam Carolla, who's uh, well, he's a trip unto himself. So he's kind of <laughs> he's a funny guy. And, he's a uh, comedian. Yeah. Yeah, so I've been doing uh, you know a few of the podcasts, and then um, I'm not exactly sure. I think we're gonna try to do something book signing wise in Los Angeles, but we haven't really picked a date yet. So we'll see how that works. Great, thank you so much for jumping on the show with me for a little bit. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Things you're not supposed to know. Religion is a well organized pocket guide to typically unknown bits of information about that ever present and always controversial topic of religion. You can find a link to where you can find the book, as well as most other things you heard today, as always, on our website, skepticality.com. Join our discussion forums at www.skepticality.com. Leave feedback by email at feedback at skepticality.com or by phone at area code 206-888-HOAX. That's 206-888-4628.